Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to Raw Knuckles Podcast. Please like, follow, and subscribe. Like I would like to say that the President of the United States knew who I was and knew, like, knew everything about me, and then I would look kind of cool, but I knew it was coming. Their like, speechwriter or whatever had called me, or whatever, a couple weeks before, and been like, hey, like, just a little bit like with the hair or whatever, so I, just a little thing or whatever. So I kind of figured something was coming, and then if you... I've watched it a couple of times because when he when he says, you know, I have a beautiful hair or whatever, he turns around and I'm like ninety nine point nine percent sure he didn't have a clue <laughs> on Which where one I you was. Or, oh, he, he had no idea. And my hair was shorter a little bit, too. And I because I remember looking at him, he turned around and we met eyes just for a second. I'm like, that dude has no idea who he's talking about or two right now. So it was funny. That'll be a suspension. That'll be a fine. Nyland going ballistic. He's a freaking madman. I'm Chris Nyland, and this is the Raw Knuckles Podcast. Anyway, let's get cranking here. Saskatchewan, Fort Saskatchewan. Geez, what is it about Saskatchewan? You know, Kelly Chase, all the boys. They they produce some of the toughest hockey players on the planet. What What is that? You know what? This actually sets up perfect. I get this all the time as well. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Every Kelly Chase, Wendell Clark, Jim McKenzie, right? the list goes on and on. They're from Saskatchewan. I wasn't even anywhere near those guys' level, and that makes <laughs> sense because I'm from Alberta. So I'm from oh. Fort S- Yeah, it's a common... Oh. Oh, okay, I thought it was. Oh, jeez, I get it all the time. So, <laughs> okay. Fort Saskatchewan is like 15 minutes from Edmonton. It's yeah. on the North Saskatchewan River. It's right. It's basically a suburb of Edmonton now. But we got yeah. a couple players from there. Uh, myself, Ray Whitney, and I played together. Uh, Richard Matvichuk. I think Joffrey Lupel uh, yeah. would consider himself from Fort Saskatchewan. So there's been some players from that area too. But yeah, I try and stay away from those Saskatchewan guys who yeah. won't have any teeth left. <laughs> so um, I stand to be corrected, and I am. Um, I, I, before I get into the hockey and some of the fun stuff, yeah, wh- what enticed you to climb fucking Mount, Mount Kilimanjaro? <laughs> I, I gotta Absolutely. like I when I saw that I'm there. That's that's fucking unbelievable. Cause I remember when I retired from hockey, fuck, you know, I, I was lost. I, yeah, I couldn't find my way. F- forget about climbing. I f- fucking <laughs> climb the <laughs> climb a fucking ladder. I never mind. <laughs> what? You, how'd that come about? You know what? To this day, that happened in 2016, and I, I will say it was a really cool experience for me. I will say it's been the one and only mountain I've ever hiked. So I am not a hiker. Uh, And how it ended up coming about was uh, uh, a lady named Erin worked for the Detroit Red Wings when I was there. And she worked for some different charity things on the side. Then she went to the crack. And anyways, after I retired, she was like, hey, Mike, we're doing this. Like, And she did a lot of stuff with veterans, which I think is very, very cool. So she like invited me to this uh, and I wanted to take part in in, it, in anything really. And so the first thing she asked me, she's like, hey, we've got this cross country uh, motorbike rally that starts in San Diego, ends in Washington, D.C. You should come. I'm like, hey, Aaron, I've been on a dirt bike one time in my life in Minnesota <laughs> for about two and a half seconds. And I almost ran myself through the end of my garage. I go, I, I can't ride a bike. She's like, oh, okay. The next thing she invited me to, so I kind of felt bad a little bit. Next thing she invited me to was a triathlon. I'm like, hey, Aaron, I'm like, look, the bike, I can do the pedal bike. I can do that. No problem. I'm like the running. I could, I I know I don't look like it, but I could actually, I was actually a decent runner back in the day. I go, no problem. But I go, Aaron, there's a pretty good chance I get in that water. I'm like, I'm not going to make it any more than like 30 meters. And I'm going to be panicking and drowning. I'm out. And so the third thing she came to me with was, hey, do you want to hike Mount Kilimanjaro? So in my head, I'm like, you know, to me, Kilimanjaro is kind of the same thing as Everest. I didn't know anything about it. And I'm like, Aaron, I'm like, I'm not, I don't have any mountaineering skills. Like, (laughs) I'm like, you got a push-up contest or something I can do. Yeah, Yeah, at least least I'll make it through that. (laughs) Um, But actually, Kilimanjaro, she's like, it requires no no mountaineering skills. All you got to be able to do is walk. I'm like, really? And she's like, yeah. So I said, yeah, sure. Okay, I'm in. 
So that was like two years. I mean, we booked it like two years out. So then I kind of not forgot about it, but I'm, you know, it's two years away. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, the date's getting closer and closer. I got to get some flights. I'm like, where the hell is Mount Kilimanjaro? So anyways, you fly into Tanzania and anyways, it ended up, I will say it ended up, I, I, I was eight days on the mountain. It was, uh, you know, I, I work out a little bit and stuff, but like I had heard the year before they went with like 10 people, 10 guests and like four of them didn't make it, but I like, like didn't make it as in didn't summit. They, they, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They're, they're alive and well. Yeah. Sorry. They, they had to get off the mountain, but like mm-hmm. really the pace that you walk it, out of eight days on the mountain, six of the day, well, the pace that you walk would be like, let's say if, if, and they put a guide in front of you, a guide behind you, and you have to, you're not going in front of them and you're not falling behind. If you were to walk like, I don't know, a lap of the track, 400 meters, it would probably take you about four minutes to get around once. Like you're going slow. So it's not the pace or anything, but what gets people is the altitude. Um, so, you know, six of the days weren't bad. It was like eight to 10 hours of, of just walking. Um, two of the days I will say were probably two of the harder days that I've ever had. The one was one of the first days because you start in the rainforest, in the jungle, and you finish in the snow. So you see everything. Yeah. I didn't really like the jungle. I sweat a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so I was sweating through everything. I'm getting poured on. So that wasn't a great day. And it was kind of a lot of up and down. And I was sliding around. And then summit day, I will say, was, I mean, when you get up there, it's 19,000 and some feet. That was that was a tough day. And, and everybody said on the, like, and the porters and stuff we had, those people are amazing. Those guys could, like, they run up right? and down that mountain. Yeah. That, that's like the greatest job around. <clears throat> They all, all were telling me the ones that could speak English. They're like, hey, going up's easy. It's the going down part, you know, and for seven and a half days, I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm like, I can't wait to go down. I'll tell you what, they were right. I summited that thing. We hung out and then they're like, okay, go down at your own pace. And that was, I was under the impression it was like an hour away to get the camp. It was like six and a half. And, wow. and but you could kind of see it in the distance. And it looked not that far away, but it was far away. And I will say that was that was one of the hardest days. I mean, I got into camp. I collapsed. One of the porters, I called him Snoop Dogg. He kind of looked like Snoop Doggy <laughs> Dog. I called him Snoop. I laid in, in my tent. He gave me a little bowl of soup. I pounded it, and I was out for 13 hours. Get closer to the action in the Fight Club with the Raw Knuckles podcast over on Patreon. Whether you're an instigator, enforcer, or aiming for the Hall of Fame, there's something for everyone waiting for you. Don't miss your chance to be part of the ultimate hockey community. Off the mountain climbing and and, and back to the hockey. Um, sure. You, you grow up playing hockey, Canada. And, and most Canadian kids, they play junior hockey. Yep. Why? uh north dakota and and how, how'd that all come about yeah it, it was all by accident uh i you know i played professional hockey or anything i just really enjoyed competing i, I liked playing hockey that was it i never had i never had any intentions of professional hockey it was never really real really? for me and so, Wait, did not, you grow up a fan of it like edmonton oh or? yeah like no, i was yeah. A, i was a yeah i was a fan of uh i was a fan of the, I, I paid attention to it i loved it you know, I, I cheered for the underdogs. So when I was growing up, the Oilers, you know, I was, it was right down the street, basically. But I cheered for the underdog flame. I mean, the Flames were good, too. But the Oilers were the Oilers. And yeah. my favorite my favorite player was Cam Neely of the Boston Bruins. Like, I, yeah. I paid attention a little bit. But it just for me, I never – I just enjoyed playing. And that was it. And um, I was picked in the last round of the WHL draft to Tacoma. They ended up moving to Kelowna. I didn't even know there was a draft or anything. I had no clue. Um, and anyways, long story short, my, my kind of plan was I played a year of, of midget hockey when I was in grade 11 and I had an awful year. I broke my ankle and I was never like growing up, like I worked hard and everything, but if you were to come watch a game and like name off the top five players on the Fort Saskatchewan Rangers, I would guarantee <laughs> that I'm not even anywhere near the top five. Like you wouldn't have. I wasn't doing anything special, um, but something clicked for me when I was in grade 12 a little bit. I went to camp with Kelowna and I was on the team um, and that's what I wanted to do. I was like, this sounds awesome. You know, 
you know, get out of that, whatever. It's junior hockey, and I, I went and watched a lot of WHL games too growing up, so that's what I wanted to do. My parents were both big into education, um, and so my mother was the principal of the high school in town, and so she would get the odd horror story of, like, you know, a guy, you know, leaving to go play junior, and he either doesn't go to school or – if he's in the States, maybe the credits don't transfer. And they both just wanted me to finish high school and then I could do whatever I want. So they were like, look, if you can make the Kelowna Rockets, you should be able to make the Fort Saskatchewan Traders. Do that for a year. And once once you graduate, you can do whatever you want. So that's how I ended up back for my grade 12 year. I played a year with the Traders. I had never, no bullshit. I didn't know college hockey existed. I couldn't have told you of one of the teams. I'd never seen a game and I was playing uh, tier two. And the first time I ran into the guy too, like a decade ago, he was one of the assistant coaches for BU. So I was sitting in the, the dress room after practice and head coach Doug Shum comes in. He's like, Hey Mike, BU's upstairs. You should get up there and talk to him. I'm like, Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. He walks out. I'm like, what, what the hell is BU? Do you remember his name, Mike? God, I'd have to text no. Chris O'Sullivan yeah. and get it. Cause yeah. I ran into him. I'll figure it out, man. He yeah, was a yeah. great guy. Okay. I saw him years. I saw him years later and, and, and we, we laughed about it. Um, so I go upstairs and I'm like, Hey, and you know, he had, thank God he handed me the, you know, the little pamphlet or booklet or whatever. So I look at it, BU Boston university. I'm like, Oh, okay. And he's like, Hey, yeah. You ever thought about playing college hockey? I'm like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't have <laughs> no idea. <laughs> Um, but then he, he was talking about something called a fly down and I didn't know what that was. And anyways, he left and a couple more teams came and, and North Dakota came and North Dakota was the first one to offer me a fly down. So I basically just, I was all, I was going to go to junior at the, once high school was over, uh, I ended up flying to North Dakota. And the only real reason was I was, I just turned 17 and it was my first trip by myself without my parents. That was the only reason why I went. And I went down and I watched a weekend series, North Dakota versus Colorado College. And I guess to put it bluntly, uh, I was blown away. I mean, I'm sitting in the stands, the, you know, 6,000 people in the stands. And, you know, I'd been a few junior games and none of them, there are some great places and great fans in junior too. I'm not, I'm not going that direction at all, but it, the places I had been, it was not like this. So I'm sitting here watching this game. I'm 17 years old. There's college girls around. The building is rocking and kind of go out with the guys after. And I'm like, you know what? I think well, these guys, I think I should, I'm going to this North Dakota. Good. This yeah. is pretty I'm good. Like, Screw Kelowna. I'm like, I'm going to North Dakota. So I went because I'm like, you know, I, it looked like a lot of fun. And at the end of the day, I was like, look, worst case, I'm like, well, not worst case. I was like, you know what? I can go to school for four years, play here for four years. Hopefully I leave with a degree and then I do whatever's next. And so that's how I ended up at, at North Dakota. Get closer to the action in the Fight Club with the Raw Knuckles podcast over on Patreon. Whether you're an instigator, enforcer, or aiming for the Hall of Fame, there's something for everyone waiting for you. Don't miss your chance to be part of the ultimate hockey community. So that college career, you know, Canadian kid going down playing. I play with a lot of Canadian kids at Northeastern, right? Because yep. they had a tough time recruiting. So they had to go to Canada. They got none of the American kids. They all went to BU or BC or Harvard and all that. But um, that college career, um, do you feel that kind of prepared you? for the NHL as opposed to maybe playing junior? Because a lot of kids, like you said, you didn't know about college hockey. I, I was growing up in Boston in, you know, the 70s. I didn't have a fucking clue about junior hockey, right? right. I know. Yeah. I always say this. If I fucking played junior hockey, I probably wouldn't have been a first-round pick because I could play halfway decent, Yeah. and I, I would would have been fighting a lot, right? I look <laughs> at Jimmy Mann. <laughs> Jimmy Mann was a fighter, Yeah. right? You, you know the name Jimmy. He was a fucking yeah, first-round pick. He was a first yeah. round pick. You know, yeah. I think he had ended up with like three goals in the NHL. I love him. I'm not disparaging him. Yeah. But like he was a first round. I, I often thought, geez, I would have loved to play junior, but I knew nothing. You would have like been you. an absolute terror in junior <laughs> you know? hockey. Let me tell you. You would have been putting up about sixty goals a year and you would have had to like back off to keep your penalty minutes under four hundred. Yeah. You would have been I, would have, a I probably terror. would have got a, a, a instead of getting a um a $7,500 signing bonus, I probably would have got a 
ten thousand dollars sign. Yeah, it would be like getting a full ride at North Dakota. (laughs) (laughs) But you know what? Yeah, so so, so, (laughs) oh, go ahead. It's I've thought about it a lot. Like, well, well, just over the years, I think it was. I think you know. I think there's positives and, and negatives to, to, to both, both ways. I think there's great things about college hockey. I think there's great things about junior. There's also the, the flip side of it too. For, for me personally, I think, um, I don't know. I, I think getting into the weight room, like college weight room and doing that kind of stuff yeah. and getting to practice a lot, I think was good for me. I was a ter- I mean, I was never a good skater at all. And I'd never worked out before. And like, I, I knew nothing about any of that stuff. So in, in that way, it was, it was good for me, I think. But on the flip side of it, I also think that, uh, you know, because I think junior hockey for me personally, like I know one of the kind of knocks against me when, when I went to college and even when I was in college was that, well, the guy's six foot four, 225 pounds. What's he going to college for? Like, yeah. you know, what, what is he? A, is he a pussy? That's like, why stigma. is he not? Yeah. That was, that was definitely, they were, they were wondering now, you know, I led my team in, in, when I was playing for the Fort Saskatchewan Traders, I led our team in fights and, and then it, kind of what ended up being a big deal for me. My second year, I got in a, in a fight against, with a guy from Wisconsin and I did, very well against them or whatever and so that kind of I think that was pretty good for me but I do think like it would be interesting to go back because I also think like once I turned pro like I could handle myself whatever but I wasn't like you know because of my size I had to fight but I never I wouldn't say that I ever really or at least took quite a while like I never really had the confidence just because I hadn't done it enough in my opinion to like go with the the big boys of my weight class, if that makes yeah. sense. Like, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. I would I would fight the Colt Nor and the Sean Thornton if I had to. Like, I was fine. I'll, I'll get in yeah. there, but I I didn't have the confidence to like. I, I wouldn't say there was any game where I like walked in there and, and be like, you know what, like these guys can kiss my ass. There's nobody over there that I'm, you know. And I think if I would have went to junior and if I would have made it through there and learned. You know, obviously yeah. a lot of things got to go right there too, right? You don't get hurt. And, you know, it'd be interesting to go back and, and try it the other way. I don't know yeah, if that well, answer made sense, but. Yeah, no, it does. I, no, it I does. hear you um, for sure. Timothy, did you have I something? I had the same there? issue. Yeah, no, I had yeah. the same issue. Yeah, you had the same <laughs> issue going to Duluth? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, Sean Thor, those guys, you know, I never uh-huh. had. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. yeah so, that's funny. You get drafted, and, uh, you go to the Devs. Now, the Devs, when. Uh, you get drafted by the devs. They were stacked on D, right? Stacked. Uh, so um, th- that's a tough nut to crack coming into it, right? It's like yeah. I look at it when I came to Montreal. The thing is, I had a it was a wing and a prayer for me, honestly. But you know, they won four Stanley Cups in a row, and I'm thinking, <laughs> like everybody else was, he's going up there. He ain't ever fucking making it there. You know, right. there's just no way they were stacked. So you go to the devs and in, in uh, Sweet Lou Lamorello and company yeah. Um, yeah and you get your career going but when you got to the nhl again they, like you said that wasn't your dream it wasn't your intention but you get there when you get there what goes through your head are you like is it was it all you thought it was going to be or were you like what the fuck is this when you yeah i would say camp? like when i first got there you know getting to new jersey new jersey was great i think looking back i think it was I don't know if I was really like for off the ice. I don't know if I was ready to be. I had a lot of learning to do off the ice. You in college there. mode still? I, college I mode? was still in college <laughs> mode. Yeah, and you know, like I said, I just have a dog. It's my first responsibility ever, really, in my life, that I got going on right now. But <laughs> like you know, Lou runs a pretty tight program, and there was some of the stuff that I didn't really get. But I have all the the utmost respect for Lou Lamarillo, and I'm. Very yeah. appreciative of them. Awesome. But I don't think I was ready for it then. Um, but, you know, I, I did get a, you know, I got a bit of an opportunity. You know, I played under one, one of the greatest things for me was when I got there. I mean, the coaching staff was, the head coach was Larry Robinson. The yeah. D coach was right. Slava Fatisov. And the guys, it was like Scott Stevens, Scott Niedermeyer, Ken Danico, Colin White, Brian Rafalski. 
like I would have had to be a like a total airhead to not learn something about <laughs> yeah. playing defense in, in, at a professional <laughs> level. Uh, so that part was awesome. Um, when I first got you know called up, uh, that was great too. Like you know, I, I still remember to this day that you know we, it was in Florida and. I couldn't really believe it was happening, to be honest. I'm like, man, yeah. this is actually happening. And I go to go out on the ice for um, for the game, and Scott Stevens pulled me aside and took his glove off, shook his hand, and said, hey, welcome to the NHL. Congratulations. I was like, oh, kind of wish he wouldn't have done that. That made me about <laughs> 10 times more nervous. But, um, yeah, it, it was a great experience. But I, off the ice, I had a lot of learning to do for sure. That was the reason why I, you know, I was only there for two years and, that, and then gone because of some mistakes I made off the ice or whatever. Uh, um, but but it was a great experience. There's no doubt about it. I appreciate your honesty there because a, a lot of people, they like to gloss over that. But it it, it, it oh, is yeah. tough. I'm, I'm yeah. coming here the first time, St. Montreal. Are you kidding me? I'm like, yeah. well, talk about college mode. Like, yeah. I was like, yeah. I mean, I'm assuming back then there was still a lot oh. of trouble you could get into in Montreal oh. playing for the Canadians. None of these, right? Oh, thank None God. of these. Thank uh, God for that. Are you ready to take your love for hockey to the next level? Join the Fight Club Raw Knuckles exclusive Patreon to unlock amazing perks like ad-free episodes, bonus interviews, and even a chance to win a game day experience with me in the Habs cave. Don't miss out on this ultimate hockey experience. So when I, I look at your career, again, 484 games, um, and you go uh, to Calgary, you get to the Stanley Cup final pretty quick. And, yeah. and, you know, I thought when I went to Montreal, four years in a row, they win it. We're going for five. I'm going to get a cup my first year. <laughs> Whoop. Yeah. Not yeah. so quick, Knuckles. And I didn't. And I honestly... So many, and we talk about this a lot, Tim and I, when we have people on. So many great players have played that game and never get a sniff at it. And yeah, you you get the Stanley Cup finally. You know what it's like to lose one, and it sucks. Yeah, but um, and I've never been there because I've only been there once, and we won. And I can't one imagine all, yeah. going all that way and not getting it. But anyway, you do. Uh, you go that first year uh, with um, Calgary. And then uh, it's off to Carolina. Now, your two longest stints with teams was Carolina and Columbus. And yep. you get to Columbus, uh, Carolina, and you get to the final now. What, what, how did it change for you when knowing you lost that Stanley Cup final and now you're here again and you're going, fuck, I remember what happened last time. I, I want to win this thing. Did yeah. You have those – Thoughts Big your, time. It, yeah, yeah. Oh, 100 percent I thought about it a lot. I was in kind of a, a different situation. I would say when I was in Calgary, I was I was just happy to be there. And I was like in, in Calgary, I think I was I was a healthy scratch the first three games of the first round, and I was a healthy scratch the last three games of the last round. I played all the games in between. Guys came back, guy a guy got hurt, and a guy came back from injury. Um you know, and, you know, against Tampa and stuff, I mean, I think I was playing, you know, four or five, maybe six minutes a night or whatever. And, and to be honest, I couldn't, I don't think I could tell you, well, I can remember my last shift that I ever played for the Flames. It wasn't a good one, but other than that, it was all kind of a blur. And, and fast forward with the lockout year in between, you know, now I was in Carolina. It was also an unexpected run as well. Calgary kind of, we got kind of just hot. We had, Calgary was the toughest by far the toughest team that I ever played for. Um, I mean, we had, we were tough I and mean, we could take the body. We were tough. We had a, we had an excellent goaltender and a hall of famer in Jerome McGinla. And there were some, obviously some other good players there too, but we, we were a, a tough team to play against where in Carolina, we were supposed to be not very good after the lockout. But I think the reason why we were good is Rutherford put a lineup together and a coaching staff together that I think we were just the quickest and the best team to adjust to the hell of a rules. goalie. Right. Hell of a goalie. Hell of yeah. A goal. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. He played great. Mm -hmm. And even him, like it, that kind of gets forgotten too, is, you know, Cam Ward was his, the lockout year was good for him too. He played a full year in the minors with me. And then he was the backup for the entire se season behind Martin Gerber. Martin Gerber was great. Right. I and mean, everybody forgets about Gerber. Gerber had like 35 wins or something like that. He was good. Uh, yeah. But then Cam got an opportunity in Montreal after we lost the first two games at home to Montreal 
and we're going into Montreal down two nothing. It's the first round. We just had a great season. We, you know, we finished one point out of. If we would have won our last game, we would have won the East. We ended up losing it to Buffalo. Um, so yeah, I, I remember. I remember thinking then because I'm like, man, we just had a great year. Like this cannot end like this. And we all played better. Um, but yeah, in, in the finals, you know, it, it obviously it sucked losing in Calgary. There's no doubt about it. But it was different, I would say, for me, just because I didn't have a whole lot to say about it, if that makes sense. You know, yeah. I, I was there, but it's not like I was a relied on. Relied you were invested upon. and really. Yeah, I was yeah. definitely invested. But, you know, yeah. when you're sitting in the in the in the stands for the last, you know, I mean, I'm cheering for these guys, but I can't do anything about it. Where with Carolina, I was playing 20 minutes a night and, you know, I needed to show up if we were going to if we were going to do well. So, yeah, yeah, it was, you know, I will say when. Things were looking great against the Oilers. We were up 3-1 at home. We get a power play in overtime in game five. Obviously, I'm not on the power play. I'm sitting on the bench, and I'm like, our power play was sick. So I'm sitting on the bench. I'm like, there's a 30, ready. There's like a 32% chance this thing's over right now. Next thing you know, I mean, I don't know what's to this day. I'm not sure what he was thinking. It all worked out, so who cares? But Corey Stillman, who was an excellent player, but he put it on the ladies' tees for Fernando Pisani under the bar, back to Edmonton. We got the shit kicked out of us in game six. And then back to Carolina in game seven, and I'm like, man, I, I – I can't lose two of these things in a row. I'm like, right. Uh, this is anyways. And I'm like, if, if nothing else, I'm going to put my, do whatever I can to put my best foot forward and, and hopefully it works out. And it did. Yeah. yeah you wouldn't be awesome. on here. You wouldn't be on here if you would have lost. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, you, no would. you would too. No, of course. Of course. That's awesome. So, uh, yeah. Um, you had the long hair then. How come no more? I, I remember I looked back at my rookie. Year, I had the friggin' mini skirts, maxi skirts, and oh, you did. <laughs> Yo, know, I had that. My rookie picture. I'm like, I had the fro like you did. Maybe not <laughs> as long, but I had the fro. Um, yeah, I got a lot, and, I got a lot of issues. <laughs> One issue is I, I I can grow hair. By the time I can't grow hair anymore, it'll be I won't be doing anything anymore. I'll be six feet under. The, the hair thing was just always a fun thing. It started in yeah. college. Long story short, uh, we used to get report cards at the University of North Dakota. So after a weekend series, you were either a one, two, or a three. One, you were good. Two, you were average. Three, you were horseshit. And so me and another one, uh, one of the guys, Jeff Ulmer, on my second year, he's like, why don't we just grow our hair out until we get a three? I'm like, okay. So I, <laughs> I'd never really grown my hair out before. So I didn't. we didn't end up getting like a three until like, I ended up getting a three. There was definitely a three mixed in there, <laughs> but it wasn't until like we only had a couple games left in the regular season. I'm like, I've come this far. I'm not cutting it now. Um, and I could tell it was like kind of popular with the kids and stuff like that. And I had fun with it. And so I did it every year. Um, well, except I didn't do that shit when I was in New Jersey. I kind of started <laughs> yeah, growing right. it out. Oh, yeah. Lou <laughs> yeah. Lamarillo was having no, none you're of that. Done. I yeah. kind of had it growing just like a little bit longer than it is now, kind of all around, not unruly by any stretch. And when Lou called me up for my first game, meeting his office, he's like, congratulations, Mike, you're playing tomorrow, whenever the game was. He's like, on one condition. I'm like, yeah, Lou, whatever. He goes, you you leave here and you go straight to the barber. You go get a haircut right now. <laughs> I'm like, none, Lou. And so Lou was having none of that. But every other year I grew it out. And the two years I went to the finals, it, it ended up being a good thing. I Calgary was kind of right when the Gillette 3, the Mach 3 razor blade came out. So they right. donated like $30,000 when I shaved my head at the end for charity. Yeah, which and is then, cool. Uh, yeah, it was cool. Right. And yeah, Carolina, really we neat. did like a haircut for the Jimmy V Foundation. Uh, so yeah, it all... It was just a fun it's thing. It's funny. Kind of it's funny how a guy with no hair wants everybody to fucking have yeah. no hair too, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, he doesn't want like, to be by himself. Yeah. Don't be jealous, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's a good man. Um, mm -hmm. So that Stanley Cup, you go to the White House. You met two presidents. You went yeah. once, Clinton, uh, and then Bush. And Bush obviously had something to say about uh, your hair. Which, yeah. did you know that was coming or was it kind of, yeah, you know, I it mean, coming. it's a lot cooler if I would lie about this and make shit up, yeah. but I don't like doing that. So I won't yeah. like, I would like to say that the president of the United States knew who I was and knew like knew everything <laughs> about me. 
and then I would look kind of cool. But I knew it was coming. Their like speechwriter or whatever had called me, or whatever, a couple of weeks before, and been like, yeah. "Hey, like just a little bit, like with the hair or whatever." So I just a little thing or whatever. So I kind of figured something was coming. And then if he, I've watched it a couple of times because when he when he says, you know, beautiful hair or whatever, he turns around and I'm like ninety nine point nine percent sure. He didn't have a clue on <laughs> Which where one I was. Or, oh, he, he had no idea. And my hair was shorter a little bit too. And I, because I remember looking at him, he turned around and we met eyes just for a second. I'm like, that dude has no idea who he's talking about or two right now. So it was funny. But the White well, House visits were, were awesome. Well, a lot of presidents have that problem. They don't know what the fuck is going on. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, there's a few of them. Not just yes, George no, Bush. No. Yeah. No, no. It wasn't just a him <laughs> thing. That's for sure. Get into the action with Fight Club, Raw Knuckles' new exclusive Patreon. From ad free episodes to uncensored content and discounts on merch, there's something for every hockey fan. Join the Fight Club today. You go through your career, you go to Columbus, and then, and again, I don't want to get too into this, but we Mm -hmm. obviously have to talk about, you know, the end of your career and and how it ended and what happened there with, well, again, the elephant in the room, every time everybody sees Mike Commodore, they think, oh, let's scum out Babcock, but yeah. There's some legit, you have legitimate reasons for that. And, you know, I've certainly had similar things with coaches. Sure. I left Montreal here. Uh, Jean Perron, we had it out. I, you know, I had a, a teammate, a uh, captain, say to me uh, once, Chris, and I was having an issue with the coach. He said, you don't always have to like your boss, but you have to respect them. Yeah. And I begged to differ. And yeah. I said, listen, here's the deal. If if I cannot like him and not respect him either, because if I don't get that respect from a guy, yeah. you sure as hell ain't getting it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not returning it. I, I yeah. think you must have had those feelings when it came yeah. to Mike Bab- Babcock. And, and and why was it? What what was dang, to get yeah. to the first so of there it, was what oh was yeah it? I'll get yeah to get to first off and one thing I was wow he just didn't like hard coaches like no that's not the case yeah. like they call Babs an old school coach or whatever like I enjoyed their 99.9 percent of my well there was two I didn't like that's it other yeah. than that I, I respected my coaches a couple of them maybe weren't my cup of tea but I didn't care yeah. and I enjoyed if somebody was hard on me I, I liked that I thought I played better yeah. if my if the head coach was hard on me, that wasn't it at all with Babs. Babs was, uh, I, I never, res- well, then there's, if you know, you'd have a hard time getting guys to say anything like this on camera, just cause they just don't yeah. want to, you know, want to avoid it. But a few things have slipped out. Like, like Mike Babcock's a bad person. He treats people yeah. terribly when the, when the TV cameras aren't around, he is a bad person. And in a nutshell, you know, and when I went on Twitter, the only reason why I ever ended up going on Twitter and ripping, I was sitting in Carolina. I had just retired and Babs, it was his first game back in Detroit after he went to Toronto. I had no intentions of saying and uh, no intentions. And I never viewed this Babcock thing like going on for almost a decade now. Like that was not my <laughs> plan. I had no plans yeah. of doing any of this shit. And I was I sitting you. at the bar. I had a couple cocktails and Chris Chelios messaged me. Chris Chelios hates him. And I, I'm, I'm happy to say my, that because Chris favorite, has said that publicly. My favorite oh, he, teammate. Yep. Oh, he's great. So he messages yep. me and he's like, hey, Kami, Toronto's in Detroit tonight. I'm like, yeah, I see that. Uh, I see that, Chelly. What's up? He's like, you should rip Babs on Twitter. <laughs> I'm oh, like, you shit the starva. Oh, yeah. No, I'm like sitting there at the, the bar. Chili. I've had five or six <laughs> doubles. And I'm like, I go, really? Yeah. He's like, yeah, I think you should. So we got, I'm like sitting there. I got a Hall of Fame defenseman saying I should do this. I also did take a minute. I'm like, okay, if I do this, I need to be comfortable that I'm not trying to get a job in hockey because you can't yeah. be <laughs> sitting on social media, ripping on people like, Anybody who doesn't know me is going to be like, this guy's an asshole. Like, I'm, I don't want him part of my organization. Is he going to rip me too publicly? So, like, I thought about it, and I'm like, you know what? I'm not looking for a job in hockey. I hate Babs more. 
screw it. So <laughs> that kind of went off. But the, the reason why I, there's multiple reasons, but the one big one for me, um, when I got bought out in Columbus, now Ken, Ken Holland and I, who was the general manager, he's now with the Oilers. He was in Detroit at the time. Ken are still buddies to this day. We just played golf together. He's down legit, here yeah. He's a great yeah. guy. Le- yeah. And long story short, I got bought out in Columbus and uh, I knew Ken liked me. I went to his golf tournament before, whatever. So I get bought out June 30th and I'm thinking, talk to my agent. And he's like, hey, you know, we're probably going to have to wait till August. You know, maybe, it, maybe you get something, maybe a professional tryout. In my opinion, I thought I could still play. I go, sounds good. Next morning, free agency opens. Five minutes into free agency, I get a phone call from my agent. I'm like, what, what? I never talked to my agent all the time. Like, it wasn't like I talked to him. I talked to him maybe <laughs> once, twice a year, maybe. And I'm like, you know, so I'm like, what the hell does this guy want? So I answer the phone and he's like, hey, I got a contract offer for you. I'm like, well, what is it? He's like, one year, one million bucks. I'm like, one way? He's like, yeah. I'm like, this is five minutes into free agency. Nobody's thinking of calling me except whoever this is. So I'm like, wow. I'm like, well, who is it? It's like Detroit. My first words, I'm like, I am not going to Detroit. Mike <laughs> Com- or Mike Babcock wants to get me in there so he can end my career. This is my last chance. Like, I just got bought out. I'm lucky to get another chance. If this one doesn't work, I'm definitely done. So anyways, we chat. He didn't know about the stuff that happened earlier. And I'm like, look, I'm like, can you just put him off? He's like, Ken said you got 15 minutes to make up your mind. In 15 minutes, this contract's gone, and he's going to go a different direction. So I got to make up my mind before anybody else is even thinking of, of calling me, uh, to, you know, to maybe offer anything. So I'm like, okay, I'm like, I'll call you back. So I call Ken. I'm like, Ken, I'd love to play for you. I would love to play in Detroit. I'm like, you know what? I think your head coach, we were having beers last summer. I was ripping on him. I'm like, does he want me on the team or not? Yeah, he does. I'm like, do you believe him? I go, I think he just wants me in there to end my career, Ken. This is my last chance. You know that. He goes, no, I believe him. I'm like, give me his phone number. Gives me his phone number. I got 10 minutes left. I call uh, Mike Babcock. Yeah. I go, hey, it's Mike Commodore. Oh, hey, Commie, how you doing? I literally went went like this to the phone. I'm like, Commie? I'm like, you're not my buddy. And I go, hey, Babs, you know, I'm friends with Ken. I go, this is real simple. I go, I have to make up my mind here. I go, do you want me on your hockey team or not? If you don't, if I'm not going to get a fair shake, I go, I I just need to know I'm going to get an opportunity. I'm not looking for anything special, but I I need to know I'm going to get a fair shake. I go, if it's Ken that wants me on the team and you don't, please just tell me now. I'll say no and I'll I'll go elsewhere. No, no, no. We need a right-handed shot, a physical presence, and somebody to play with Nick Lidstrom, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, seriously, Babs, you know this is my last (laughs) chance. Do you want me on the team or not? Am I going to get a fair shake? Yeah, 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 yeah. You'll get know, just <laughs> talking right out of his ass. So I hang yeah. up the phone, call my agent back. He's like, well, what'd he say? So I'm like, well, he says I'm going to play with Nick Lindstrom. So obviously my agent's like, hey. And, you know, I'm thinking about it too. I'm like, ah. But my gut yeah. instinct, I'm like, this guy's going to screw me. I knew it. Uh, But I got thinking about, man, I play with Nick Lidstrom. You know, Detroit's good. We're going to make the playoffs. I play with Nick. All I got to do is go D to D all year. I'm going to have 35 points. Like I'm like, this is maybe I get another five-year deal. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. I'm like, maybe I'm just getting started again. (laughs) And so I signed the contract and I get to Detroit. And and it was like painfully obvious from the word Right off the hop. Oh, right off the hop. Yeah, he uh, let me play in a couple exhibition games, and we started the season, and it was scratch, 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 scratched all the way through until I think it was November first. Uh, there, if a, if there was like a date, you know, somebody missed a game, he was calling guys up from the minors to keep me scratched. He was blowing down drills like two on ones and three on twos in practice when it was my turn to go. Like it was the most blatant thing ever, and, and I knew it was over. Yeah, so that that's sucks. why. I, I, no, I mean, I hear you. I hear all he you. had to do was say, "Hey, man, I don't want you on the team," or "I'm not." No problem. Like I would have. I wish he would have said that. But at the end of the day, I learned something from it too. I'm like, you know what? Always trust your gut. Yeah, I should have said right? no. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about it on a podcast ten years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm getting crazy. even well, now, Babs. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's how old were you then? You were what, 34? Uh, no, I would have been 31. One. 
Okay, thirty-one ish. Yeah. So you you're getting there. Like, oh you know, yeah. I always I I always say thirty-four is a cutoff number, especially yeah. for a forward because I played forward. But I boy, it started getting tough at the end. The fight, yeah. You know, oh, the, sure. just I felt you, you. You, it's hard to be honest with yourself and say, listen, I'm near the end. Um, you know you're there, but you, you you can't. It's hard to come to grips with. Put it that way. Big, and big I'm sure. I'm not the only guy that has been no. through that, but so you. And when you look at it, like I'm fully aware that like I, ninety nine point nine percent of guys don't get to retire on their own terms. You know, no. we aren't all Nick Lidstrom. We aren't all yeah. Scott Niedermeyer. Like I totally, totally get it for sure. But yeah, just for me, it was like, man, like I, I like I didn't have another you know ten years in the t- like I'm not saying that at all, but. It was yeah. also not the way I was looking for it, but whatever yeah. shit happens. Well, yeah, and and again, t- you have that issue, and then you look at some of the things he did, right? With Johan Franson, you Francis look at Matt. what happened with Spezza in Toronto. You know, I, and I get it. Coaches have to win hockey games, but are you kidding me? The first game of the fucking year, and Spezza comes back. He comes to Toronto, and. And then Madonna with fifteen hundred games. Too. Okay, yeah. we gotta win. We gotta win so bad. I'm not gonna yeah. play this fucking guy. That yeah. to me is like no, like the Madonna one. Something wrong there. I, I tell you what, if I was Mike Madonna with his credentials, I would have been screaming that from the rooftops. But he's never said yeah. a word. But his is that's the story. I you know because I get the Babs thing a lot now. If I go to like some speaking stuff. I, yeah, you can't get away from it. But well, Tim you know, wanted to start with that, but yeah, I said no I just way. Tim. To talk it right up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been forty-five <laughs> minutes just on Babs. Um, no, but no. yeah, they you know the Medano thing was you know they the Detroit guys told me yeah it's like game seventy-six you know he has to play the last five games to get to fifteen hundred scratches yeah. on game seventy-six tells the media uh. hey. Uh, I didn't bring Mike Medano here for the regular season. I brought him in for the playoffs. Playoff starts, he scratches him then too. And it's like, dude, do you think everybody You know, different? and it's funny. Like, you hear, you hear all this stuff about him, the greatest coach, this and that. And listen, uh, intelligent guy about the game, I get all that. But mm-hmm. when I saw Chelly, yeah, when yep. I, it, the people person, it, it, it's different. Now, oh, when I saw Chelly cool. near the end and how he was being benched and he was sat, and I'm thinking, okay, what's Chelly? 40 fucking six at the time, 47, whatever yeah. it was, 48. Yeah. He and I'm going, him. come on, Chelly. I mean, I know you're upset with not playing, but you're fucking almost 50. Yeah. Like, hello. And, yeah. and, and, you know, I, I know he was pissed off and not playing and had some bitterness there, and that's fine. But I was wondering, can this guy be the asshole that, you know, everybody's saying he is? And then I see the Mana thing, uh-huh. okay? Mitch yeah. Mana. Yeah. And we had um, Marty Walsh on. Yeah. And we talked Marty. to Marty. I said, this is your first, um, your first thing you really had to deal with as uh, the head of the Players Association. And he said, Chris, yeah, we went down, we addressed that. And he said that was a big thing, but that wasn't even the thing that put it over the top. There was something else there. It's okay. not just going in the phones. Okay. It was something. Remember, Tim, we talked to him. If yeah. you look at the episode of Marty Walsh, he talks about I'd it. I'd be there. interested to hear about that, yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's right around, I, I don't know, kind of in the middle. But okay. he um, he talked. I said, listen, was was it just the phone thing or he said, well, there was something else there we had to address that really uh, cemented it uh, yeah. for us that we didn't want him there. So, and I, I, and I didn't push him on it because he didn't want to come out and say it, but yeah, I would love to know what the other thing was. I really would love to know what the other thing was. I'd be interested but, to know, too. I, I've heard some things coming out of there when the Columbus thing, and before it kind of blew up, I had heard, I had some messages, and I'm like, I was about to send a tweet tweet and you know what i'm so gr- glad i'm like you know what just shut your mouth nobody like when yeah. i say anything about bads people just think i'm out of my mind and i'm a raving lunatic yeah and i'm like you know what who cares less is more like and i was thinking I'm, I'm like well let them go and if this comes up again down the road maybe i'll say something um and i'm very glad i did because then with with Bisonette and he was yeah. getting a bunch of messages and then i heard a little bit more 
everything was basically phone related. I've, I thought the one yeah. thing that kind of summed from what I heard was about, I mean, you could, I don't want to use people's names, but one of their higher prospect kids uh, went through a little something that, that, that he shouldn't have had to. And so anyways, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. it's funny when biz said it too, I was like, Ooh, you're really throwing something out there. And then I saw the captain saying, well, you know, you know, it wasn't that bad. I didn't mind doing sure. it, but you know, anyway, that it's history now, but yeah. so you, I, you I know, your uh, dog. yeah, I know you got to get your dog. Yeah. Uh, I got three minutes. All right. Listen, <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh shit. Um, so you're living in Arizona now. Uh, in Arizona no now, more, yeah. No more forts on Saskatchewan. Yeah, Fort Saskatchewan, <laughs> yeah. You know what? Yeah. I love the fort, but yeah, I haven't been back there in a while. I split my time here in Calgary. So what are you doing uh, out, outside the game now for work? Are you yeah. doing the podcast? I know that. but Yeah, you got Clear in the Crease podcast doing yeah. that. Um you know what? Before COVID, I went back up to Calgary because I was like, I think it was 37. I've been 37 or 38. And I'm like, you know what? I think it's time for me to start doing something. I didn't know what that was. But so I did some sales for like a construction. Basically, we laid fiber. Triton, Triton exactly. Triton, yeah. yeah. So I did that. And, and I enjoyed that. And COVID kind of came and some other circumstances. And that kind of sunk the company. But um, but that that was good. And yeah, I basically just kind of. I guess in a perfect world, I would like to, I'm really good at killing time. I don't have kids or now I have a dog yeah. and I have a girlfriend down here or whatever. That's I'm awesome. really good at like, I can kill a day with the best of them. Like I can, yeah. <laughs> I don't get bored or, you know, I can wander around and just make kind of a day disappear. But yeah. in a perfect world, I'd like to find something to do. I just, I don't know, in a lot of ways, I'm basically the exact same when I was losing sleep in college or had a tough time falling asleep. I'd be laying in bed at the University of North Dakota being like, when I have to pick a major, and I'm like, man, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? And I'm like, <laughs> I got no answer. And I'm like, I'm still pretty much the same. So well, not much has changed. I'm with you. It's like, what's, uh, yeah, what's we, all, we all go there, right? It, yeah. it happens. So um, you're one handicap. Right, living on the uh, you... Oh yeah, I, I'm, no? I'm a I'm a single digit for sure. I go anywhere from like a one to a five. Yeah. Depends who you're uh, playing against. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I was a decent player for a little while, and then I went to Bandon Dunes four years ago, and I used to not, you know, I hit it okay, but not great. But I could chip and putt the lights out, and so you know, you can if you can chip and putt, you can play. As long as then you just got to kind of keep it in play. And I went to Bandon Dunes four years ago and chipping was like the best thing I would like that for my game. I was like what I was good at. And I left Bandon Dunes with the yips and it oh, has yeah. been four. It's a real thing. Uh, oh, it's a dude. real thing. It's terrible. It's terrible. Oh, so now I use a forward a lot, but, and it's starting to come back, but yeah, I'm, I'm not a one. Wait, anymore. how long ago was this? Like four years. And you still have the hips? No, is that what you're saying? <laughs> Oh man. Oh man, I couldn't imagine yeah. playing golf for a living and getting them. <laughs> right? Like, that would be terrible. Oh. Be um, awful. Uh, so, I you have the dog now, you have the girlfriend. It's funny, I was told once, before you get a girlfriend or you you, you think you want to get married, buy a plant mm -hmm. and take care of that plant for a year. And if that plant is still alive after a year, then you can get a dog. Then you get the dog. And if that dog call, is actually. healthy and good after you, yeah, then you can get the girlfriend. Then you can do it. Yeah. So, yeah. I like that. That's a good gotta, So you got to do it in you reverse. Get now. You get the girlfriend, <laughs> the dog, now you get the plant. No, I'm getting a plant later today. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, listen, uh, Kami, thanks so much for taking the time here with Tim no, and I. Thank it you. was fun. I, shit, I, I could have went another hour. Another hour yeah, I'm, I'm happy. Anytime you guys want to, I'm. Anytime yeah, maybe you want. We'll get yeah, you, you back need us, on. If you need us to come on yours yeah. or whatever, if you really yeah, need a we'd love to have you guys. guest. <laughs> I'll, I'll come back <laughs> on whenever, and we'd love to have you guys for sure. Yeah, how did you how did you hook up with Andrew Raycroft? Good guy, Andrew. He lives on Good guy. Boston, never right? met him. I've yeah. never met him in person. I, it was just kind of worked out through that Bodog company. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we got to get together. He seems like an awesome dude. We should do yeah. all four. All four of us do like an episode or something. Yeah, that'd be, yeah, that'd be we'll great. Do something. Perfect. Listen. Good luck with everything. Good luck with the doggy. What's the what's the dog's name going to be? Henry. Henry. 
Henry. Hank. My father's Hank. name. Hank. My father's Henry. name. Henry Hank. Henry's a good yep. boy. <laughs> yeah. That's Perfect. awesome. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Raw Knuckles podcast. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe.